Welcome, my dear students, to my continuing coverage of Chapter 8's discussion on basic concepts of chemical bonding. To begin this lecture, I want to introduce you to another hilarious chemistry cat of the day, taken from quickbeam.com. This one says, endothermic reactions. I studied them before they were cool. <laughs> In this video, then, I'm going to teach you about formal charges. So, for some molecules, we can draw more than one Lewis structure that gives all of the atoms a full octet. And to review how to draw Lewis structures, I invite you to click the link in the description beneath this video or the one floating over my head somewhere. So when this happens, we can think of the actual molecule as being a blend of all of these contributing Lewis structures. For example, we can draw two Lewis structures for carbon dioxide that both give a full octet to every atom. These structures right here. So you might ask, which one of these is right? As it turns out, both of them. In reality, CO2 structure is somewhere in between these two. We say then that these two structures are contributors to the actual structure of CO2, which exists in some mystical realm between these two. However, the more stable of these two structures is the one that contributes more. So how do we determine which one is more stable or contributes most? Well, chemists have created a bookkeeping system for doing this. We assign numbers called formal charges to each atom in the molecule. The Lewis structure that contributes most, that is, the one that's the most stable, follows these rules. First, the most stable structure will be, generally speaking, the one in which all of the atoms have formal charges that are closest to zero. Now, if you're in a situation where there's no such structure, in other words, there is a formal charge that is a non-zero number for every single structure, then what do we do? Well, in those cases, ones where the Lewis structures have charged atoms, the most stable structure will be the one that gives a negative charge to the more electronegative atoms and a positive charge to the less electronegative atoms. So you might ask, okay, Mike, how in the world do we calculate this mystical formal charge? Well, one way to think about formal charge is this. The formal charge of any atom in a molecule is the charge that that atom would have if all of the atoms in the molecule were equally electronegative. Okay, that might seem conceptually confusing, but there's a simple equation for calculating it. An atom's formal charge in any Lewis structure is equal to that atom's number of valence electrons minus the sum of one per bond plus one per dot. That's it. Let's address this by looking at some example lecture problems, which I'm going to actually answer for you in this video. I want you to assign formal charges to each of the following ions. All right, I'm going to take you through these. We begin by using the principles taught in an earlier video to draw the Lewis structure of cyanide CN-, which is shown right here. Then we remember that an atom's formal charge equals that element's number of valence electrons minus one per dot plus one per bond. Let's begin then by figuring out the formal charge of carbon. Now, as you look at the periodic table, you'll see that carbon is in column 4A, which means that it has four valence electrons. So I put the number four in here for its number of valence electrons. Now I'm going to subtract from that one per bond plus one per dot. How many bonds does this carbon have going to it? Yeah, it's got one, two, three. How many dots are on this carbon? There are two. So I'm gonna add up three, that is one per bond, plus two, which is one per dot. So the formal charge on this carbon is four minus three plus two equals minus one. Make sense? Good. Let's do the same thing for nitrogen. Nitrogen being in column 5A of the periodic table has five valence electrons. In this structure, how many bonds are there to nitrogen? Yeah, there are three. And how many dots? There are two. So its formal charge here is five minus three plus two, which equals zero. Now let's assign formal charges to all of the atoms in sulfate right here, beginning by drawing its Lewis structure. Now this is not the only possible Lewis structure you could draw, as I'll explain in a moment. For this Lewis structure, the sulfur atom's formal charge will of course begin by writing out its number of valence electrons. Because it's in column 6A of the periodic table, sulfur has six valence electrons. Now in this Lewis structure, how many lines or bonds are there going to the sulfur? Yeah, there are one, two, three, four. How many dots are on that sulfur? Zero. So its formal charge will be six minus four plus zero, which equals positive two. How about for the oxygens? Well, all the oxygens have the same numbers of dots and bonds around them. Being in column 6A of the periodic table then, oxygen of course has six valence electrons. And in this structure, each oxygen has one line, that is one bond, and six dots. So its formal charge will be six minus one plus six, which equals negative one. But what if we draw a different and also acceptable Lewis structure, the one shown right here, in which our sulfur is surrounded by 10 total electrons. 
Now you look at that and might think, there's no way this could be stable. Well, remember that sulfur is in row three of the periodic table. Once you hit row three and below, elements actually do have the ability to violate their octet. That is to have more than eight electrons around them. And how stable is this compared to the other Lewis structure? Well, that's gonna come down to the formal charges of all of the atoms here. You can see that once again, sulfur has six valence electrons. And how many lines or bonds are there going to the sulfur? There are six. How many dots? Zero. So the formal charge for this sulfur in this structure is gonna be six minus six plus zero, which equals zero. Now, how about the oxygens? In this case, the oxygens look a little bit different depending on which ones I'm considering. For the left and right oxygens that just have a single bond going out to them, I take the number of valence electrons for oxygen, which is six, and subtract from them one for a line and six for the dots around the oxygen. That's gonna give me this number right here, formal charge of negative one. But what about for the top and bottom oxygens? Well, again, I take the valence number six and then look at either of these two top and bottom oxygens. We'll just look at the one on the top. There are two bonds going to it and four dots. So its formal charge is six minus two plus four, which equals zero. Now, remember what I taught you before about formal charges? When you're dealing with two different Lewis structures, the one that has the smallest number of formal charges will actually be the more stable one. Thus, we see that in this case, the structure that has the largest number of zero formal charges across the atoms will actually be the more stable one. Thus, we see in this case, this structure having zero formal charge on the sulfur and two out of the four oxygens is actually more stable than the earlier one right here in which all of the atoms have non-zero formal charges. Let's move on then to another formal charge related problem. I want you to complete each Lewis structure below by adding electron pairs where missing and then indicate the formal charge of each nitrogen atom. For some reason, a lot of my students, when handling this problem, think that they need to follow the official process for drawing Lewis structures by counting up all of the valence electrons for all of the atoms in these structures. For this problem, I have not specified that you do so. In other words, for this question, all I want you to do is add lone pairs wherever needed in order to complete every atom's octet, with the exception of hydrogen that only needs a two-tet. And I don't care where those electrons come from. In other words, you can see that the oxygen right here has a single bond to its left and to its right, which amounts to two plus two is four total electrons. To complete its octet then, it's going to need two lone pairs, which I'll draw one up top and one down bottom. Now that oxygen is surrounded by eight electrons. Again, I don't care where those electrons came from for the purpose of this question. I just want you to draw lone pairs wherever necessary on all of the atoms to fulfill their octets. Make sense? Here, the nitrogen is surrounded by two, four, six electrons embedded in three total bonds. So it needs one lone pair to complete its octet. And the oxygen here on the right needs two additional lone pairs to complete its octet. Now let's move to the molecule here on the right. To complete the octet of the oxygen on the left, it needs two lone pairs. So it's surrounded by two, four, six, eight. And you'll notice it doesn't really matter if I draw the lone pairs on opposite sides of each other or one up top and one to the right or one up top and one down bottom or one down bottom and one to the right or left. It doesn't really matter. I just wanna make sure that I fulfill their octets. So if you'd drawn one of these lone pairs over here on the left side, that would be totally okay. The central nitrogen here needs one lone pair to complete its octet and the oxygen to the right needs three lone pairs. So now we've done the first half of this question. Now the second half, calculating formal charge of each nitrogen atom. Well, remember that formal charge is equal to number of valence electrons minus one per bond plus one per dot. Because nitrogen is in column 5A of the periodic table, it has five valence electrons. In this leftmost structure, how many bonds surround or go to this nitrogen? Yeah, there are one, two, three. And how many dots are on it? Two. So the formal charge here will be five minus three plus two, which equals zero. How about the nitrogen on the right? Well, again, same number of valence electrons, five. How many bonds flow to it? There's one, two, three. And how many dots? There are two. So its formal charge will also be five minus three plus two, which equals zero. We end then with this problem right here, which I won't answer for you, but invite you to try on your own. Which of the following proposed structures for CO2 is the greater contributor? Remember, the greater contributor will be the one that has the largest number of zero as its formal charges across all of its atoms. Until next time, my dear students and others, thanks for watching and please have an enjoyable rest of your day.